1 Thessalonians 5, and uh, just a couple more words here about the end of uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. I've uh, been working for two or three weeks on establishing that the, uh, that the uh, uh, rapture uh, of the church is not only premillennial, it's pre-tribulational, and that's what we've been going through. And we'd already commented on um, verses 15 through uh, 17 or so in 1 Thessalonians 4. Just one last thing. Notice verse 18 one more time and it remind you about something there. Uh, notice it says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And uh, those words, of course, have to do with the rapture, with the fact that you know Jesus Christ is going to come back and get us out of here. But would you please also note that uh, we are to comfort one another with words. Okay? It's not, it's not feeling. We're not supposed to comfort one another with, with feelings about the rapture or hand-holding about the rapture or... We're supposed to comfort one another with words. The words of God are supposed to be the comfort to you. It's not just a sentiment. you understand? All right, we're going to start 1 Thessalonians 5. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, uh, teach and preach the Word of God this morning. Um, We hope that uh, the folks that are under the weather, we've got uh, some sickness going through church right now. We pray you'll get them back on their feet. And uh, we pray that you'll bless this hour we have together in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. Now, having just touched uh, on the rapture for several verses, Paul goes right on. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, uh, ye have uh, no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So he's still uh, on the uh, end time scenario. And he says, but of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. And the idea is that we don't know the, uh, the hour or the day of the rapture, or for that matter, uh, specifically the hour or the day of the second coming of Christ at Armageddon or anything like that. I noticed that the new versions uh, really mess things up here. Um, I think the NASV has, uh, but of the times and epochs, E-P-O-C-H, epochs, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. So epoch is much easier to understand than seasons for most people. And um, then uh, the NIV actually has, but of the times and date, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. So apparently the NIV people have the rapture dated. I've never seen that, but uh, that's what the NIV says. Anyway, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. So we don't know the day or the hour or the rapture or anything like that, folks. But I'll tell you what we do know. We know the times and the seasons. And, uh, and that's the thing. Uh, the Lord establishes those times and the seasons. Look, if you will, to um, Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, and you probably recall the Lord's answer to uh, some specific questions about this. And um, I, uh, you know, have listened to the rapture theories and advocated a couple of them through the years and, and all that. And in general, um, I've kind of given up every time I... Sit down and talk to somebody. Uh, a lot of folks are still working on, you know, trying to get a general idea of when the rapture might be and all that. And I've kind of just departed from it. I, I think that um, there's a lot of theories, and um, I believe the seven day. I believe the seven days of uh, Hebrews four. I believe we've been we're n- now near the end, very end of the sixth day, the sixth thousandth year. That's for sure. We can prove that. And I think. The uh, seventh day, the seventh segment of thousand years is uh, the day of the Lord, uh, the day that Jesus Christ reigns on earth for, earth for a thousand years. And I don't know exactly, exactly what time it is or exactly, exactly when the rapture is. We know it soon. I believe it can be any day. You know, uh, I graduated Bible school in, in 87, and at that point uh, everybody was making predictions you know, 87, 88, 89, then it was 91, 93, and then 2000, and so on and so forth. And bottom line is, as best I can tell, nobody knows exactly what the date is on the Lord's calendar. We're on the Gregorian calendar right now from, uh, from Pope Gregory. And um, I don't know if men had it right before that or not. But uh, you don't know whether right now is 2010 on the Lord's calendar or 1990, Right? Whatever else uh, we do know, we know the times and seasons. We know the times are close. If we do have the right calendar, then if you were going to deal with, uh, you know, uh, theories of of raptures and and of the rapture and so on, 
Uh, I'm not sure why you wouldn't start the 2,000 years of the church, say at 33 A.D., when Christ died for our sins. So whether or not you're going to be around to see uh, 2030 or not, I really don't know. Because again, I've, I've given up to the point uh, of knowing the time because I believe that we don't know exactly what the date is uh, in the Lord's, on the Lord's calendar, right? And I believe He planned it that way because we are supposed to know the times and seasons, but no, there's no promise that we should know the day or the hour, right? Whatever else, folks, we know we're close. And whatever else has been shown in the last few years here, and very few years for those that have been paying attention, I mean, you know, um, when I got right with the Lord and went to Bible school in the mid-1980s or whatever, oh, things are bad. Oh, boy, things are terrible, you know. And, you know, there's got to be a coming economic collapse and all this kind of thing. And, you know, it's just imminent. And here we are, you know, now in, in, in 2010. But when I, whatever else can be said, and I know this sounds, you know, I sound like an old codger when I say this, but, folks, since, uh, just say since 2001 or so, Things have changed a lot. I mean, when you stop to consider how quickly we saw things change around, you know, the 2006, 7, and 8 uh, time frame, 2007, 8, and 9 time frame, everything from the economy to whom we've now elected as president of these United States and so on, what we have shown is that the devil is way far along on blinding the minds of them that believe not. He's shown that he's not only blinded the religious minds in general and so on and so forth, but it also shows that it goes far deeper than just you know, religious blindness. I mean, you know, it's, it's extended now where, where this world will go after someone who is a complete shell, has no standards, but just sets forth an image. And uh, they, they believe it's the greatest thing that, you know, they ever, you know, since sliced bread. And so whatever else is the case, we've seen an awful lot change, and it doesn't take a, an awful lot of an imagination now to see there uh, being a day when this world will see the need for a unified one-world government, as, a, as if they're not working on it already, a unified currency, and not only currency, but a, a unified mark by which you don't have to handle money, and all those sort of things, folks. We're, we're you know, we that... that uh, impetus that inertia has been shown to exist and whatever else is the case you know our, your feet ought to be tingling right now because the rapture gen genuinely could be any day okay still we do not know the day or the hour look in acts chapter one i believe i was going to tell you about acts chapter one and the disciples come together just as the lord's ready to uh ascend back to heaven to be seated on the right hand of the throne of god and he says in Acts 1 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his in his own power. So the times and the seasons are in the Lord's own power. And at this point it's not for them to know the times and the seasons. And yet by the time you get to First Thessalonians five, we are not to be ignorant of those times and seasons, right? I have no need that I write unto you, even though he went ahead and wrote unto them. Uh, there's no need that I write unto you for you uh, yourselves know perfectly, right? So there's a shift uh, in uh, even the New Testament as far as, you know, a move from a relative ignorance uh, you can't know to these folks did know. So the point is, uh, we, we know that we can read the signs of the times. We see the, you know, whether the sky is red at evening and all those sort of things, and folks, uh, we're primed for it, and I know that folks have said that for a long time, and uh, all I can say is that one of these days, very soon, it's going to come to pass. Um, look in First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Now, it's kind of funny because that Antichrist comes along. Look in uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 for a second. Daniel chapter 7, and the Antichrist comes along, and he has a, a bit to say about these times and seasons. Notice um, verse 23, the fourth beast and the fourth kingdom. Daniel 7, 24, ten horns, ten kings, and so on. Uh, another shall rise up after them. He'll subdue uh, uh, the others. Look in verse 25, though. 
to say Antichrist, he shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times. And not times and seasons, but times and laws. So uh, this Antichrist is going to come along, and he'll think that, he'll think and try to change times and laws. But those times and laws and times and seasons are in the Lord's hand. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. That word brethren marks, of course, the idea that uh, Christians are supposed to know some things that lost people don't know. Uh, once in a while, it, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of good to go back and think where you'd be right now if you weren't saved. I'm just talking about from a knowledge perspective. I'm not talking about you know, what gutter you might lie in or, or you know, where you're headed for eternity. But just the idea of, you know, in what kind of shape you are, how much more you know and understand about what is going to happen and what is happening and the motivations behind it and some of the X's and O's to why things are going the way they're going, uh, as opposed to some of the folks that you work with maybe on a day-to-day basis. Those folks have no idea. Those folks probably listen to the radio and think the Republican Party or the Democratic Party is the answer to everything. They have no clue, folks. You yourselves, though, because you are brethren and the Lord's shown you things from the Bible and the Holy Spirit's given you some understanding in those things, uh, of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. And if Paul went ahead and did write. <laughs> Paul was always quick to, to write a reminder and all those things, but there was no need to write unto you. Verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh uh, as a thief in the night. Okay, there are some things that you should know perfectly. Uh, you should know perfectly that, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Some things to know perfectly. You can only know that perfectly by the Bible. I mean, uh, nobody at the U of M or Hamlin University knows anything about it. <laughs> right? They don't, they don't know perfectly anything. But you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, we want to look at the day of the Lord here for a second. It's a continuing theme of uh, the Word of God. Of course, it's uh, one of the most prophesied events of the Old Testament in general. And uh, the day of the Lord is over here, properly speaking. Now, it bleeds back into the Great Tribulation. Just look here for a second. And uh, it's talking about the day of the Lord. Go to, uh, let's start with Isaiah chapter 2 real quick. And... um, this is what's in store uh, for the world. And again, this time is uh, primarily um, the end of the Great Tribulation and uh, the millennium. I believe that the millennium proper is, the, uh, is properly speaking, the day of the Lord. Uh, although usually the reference is to the second coming of Christ when He comes back in Armageddon. But look at Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2 and uh, go down to verse 12. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Go down to verse 19. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for uh, fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. It's talking about uh, the same thing it was talking about in the book of Revelation where uh, the men run and jump into holes and caves and hide under rocks to hide themselves from the face of the Lamb because when the Lamb comes back, He's mad. That's, the, that's Armageddon. That's the second coming of Christ. Look at Isaiah 13 real quick. I'm not going to run all these, but to show you that this day of the Lord thing uh, basically basically revolves around the, uh, the second coming of Christ, but it, it it extends beyond that, and I'll show you that in just a second. Look at Isaiah 13, notice verse 6. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. That's the day of the Lord. Look in uh, Joel chapter 1 real quick. Joel 1. Once in a while it's kind of fun to run through these uh, 
run through these references. Uh, first of all, it's fun because you don't have to go through it, <laughs> right? And uh, it's also uh, once in a while good to remind ourselves that while as Christians um, the love of Christ uh, constraineth us and uh, we are uh, both commanded and admonished and exhorted and urged to uh, uh, have a burden for uh, lost people and to try to win them and to turn them to, to Christ and the love of God, that there still is a time very near in the future. It's not just hell, but it is a really awful day one day when Jesus Christ comes back and takes care of this mess. All right? It's a hard day. Look in Joel, Joel 1, 15. Alas for the day, uh, for, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Look in chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not ever been... Uh, uh, I'm gonna need, uh, <laughs> there hath not been ever the light, neither shall uh, be any more after it, even of the years of many generations, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. Go on down to verse 11. The Lord shall utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for He is strong that executeth His word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Look at verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Now that's talking there. Uh, that's talking there about Armageddon, and um, I will show you uh, that it bleeds back a little bit. Look in uh, Malachi real quick. Malachi four. Malachi chapter four. Verse 5, where it says, uh, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. All right, so uh, Elijah comes back in the middle of the great tribulation, correct? So you can say that, I mean, you, you may be able to think that the, the day of the Lord bleeds back into the great tribulation just a little bit. Uh, it's interesting, is it not, once again, to point out that um, Jesus Christ said Elijah had already come all the way back here, that uh, John the Baptist could have been Elijah. So again, you see that this thing here could have been uh, compressed by 2,000 years depending on what Israel had done. But since they went ahead and killed John the Baptist who came in the spirit and power of Elijah, then that has to happen again. But uh, to show you one other thing here, look in Second Peter chapter 3 to show you uh, another little detail of the day of the Lord. Look in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm sorry, 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. And notice verse, uh, verse 8 where it says, this is where we uh, uh, piece together you know, the very, uh, the verity of uh Hebrews chapter uh, four, which establishes that there that the Lord's day, uh, or seven year, uh, um, uh, seven day week, and that uh, with four thousand years in the Old Testament and two thousand years now in the New Testament, and another thousand years that we know of, in which Christ will yet reign in the future, we've accounted for the better part of six thousand years already, six full days. So we are literally on the cusp of Jesus Christ coming back. But it says this, uh, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, verse 8, that one day is uh, with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. There's another thief in the night reference. We'll talk about that in a second. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, where in the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, according to His promise, uh, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, the point in all that is the fact that uh, the uh, new heavens and the new earth do not happen till way over here, correct? And that being the case, it says that in that day the elements will melt with fervent heat and they will be uh, dissolved. Well, that's the meltdown of the universe before the Lord remakes it with new heaven and new earth. The, the new heavens and the new earth, right? And so I, I always, you know, uh, with what little chemistry and physics that I had, I still always uh, find it kind of fruitful thought to think how Hard man has had to work and, and how late in history man figured out how to uh, access uh, the energy that is in an atom. And so you had the atom bomb in 45 and so on and so forth. And now we have nuclear energy even though the green people aren't for it and all that kind of thing. And yet the day will come, the Bible says, that the elements themselves, I'm not, you know, when we're talking about elements here, I was taught in chemistry that you don't get any smaller as an entity than an element. I mean, it's carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and so on and so forth. That those elements themselves will melt with fervent heat. And we know how fervent heat that is. I mean, a, a glop of, uh, of nuclear fissionable material this size is enough to wipe out not only this church, but this neighborhood and a great portion of this city, right? And when you stop and consider that you're sitting right now on trillions upon trillions, uh, an almost innumerable number of atoms in the chairs that you're sitting on. And one day, all the carbon and all the hydrogen, all the iron or whatever that's in those chairs, those elements themselves will melt with fervent heat. And, um, you know, whatever is holding each individual atom, each individual electron around the nucleuses of all the atoms in those chairs is going to be released, and it's going to go boom. <laughs> and it's really going to be a boom. In fact, the, the, what the Lord says, he says, uh, there will be dissolved. Now, we think of salt dissolving in water, but this time it's electrons and protons and neutrons that dissolve. And when those dissolve, they go boom. All right? And so that's what we're talking. So the point to saying all that is that the, he established that this whole thing here is the day of the Lord, bleeding back to here and going as far as the elements melting down with fervent heat. So, brethren, that seventh day is God's day of rest in Hebrews 4 and, uh, and, and, and Genesis 1 and 2, right? That is the Lord's day of rest. That is Christ's day, the thousandth year, and we're sitting right here on the sixth day. That's where we are. So, anyway... It says then, verse 2 of uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, For yourselves know perfectly um, that the day of the Lord so cometh uh, as, a, uh, as a thief uh, in the night. And um, so the Lord Jesus Christ is uh, telling the churches in Revelation, uh, I'll come one day as a thief in the night. Uh, specifically talking about the millennium, not our rapture, but their millennium. Go back to verse, uh, verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You know what you can draw from verse 3 that is a very practical thing? Whatever men say is wrong. <laughs> you know, uh, when they shall say, Peace and safety. Folks, in the great tribulation, the, the, the second coming of Christ follows the great tribulation. Right? I mean, the great tribulation is a horrific time. It's a horrible time, followed by the moon going dark, the sun going dark, the stars not shining, and Jesus Christ coming back, back in wrath and vengeance. I mean, it's a terrible time, and all the way up to the very end of that absolutely horrific time, you know what men are saying? Peace and safety. Peace and safety. <laughs> All the way to the very end. Men are never right about that stuff. They never are. 
Verse 3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, they shall not escape. Sudden destruction. I mean, he being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall be suddenly destroyed, and that without remedy. All right, when they shall say peace and safety. Okay, you know this, I know. But peace and safety, peace and safety. Look in uh, Ezekiel. Look in Ezekiel uh, chapter uh, 13 real quick. Ezekiel chapter 13. And one of the things you have to appreciate, uh, you're old enough to know this. I mean, uh, we're all going to be old codgers here one of these days, aren't we? You've heard people talk about peace in our day for as long as you've listened to the news, for as long as you've listened to politicians <clears throat> and, and uh, had the capability of understanding even what they were saying. They've been promising us peace on earth. That's what the United Nations was supposed to be about. And uh, most of you are well enough aware that there hasn't been a year that's passed that somebody in the world wasn't killing off somebody else. Where is this peace and, peace and safety everybody's talking about? I mean, we've had peace and safety here in America. That's very true. But America is the it, America is not the rule, right? And um, besides that, there's uh, more to peace than just war or non-war. Look in uh, Ezekiel chapter 13 and go down to um, verse 10. Because even because they talking about the prophets and false prophets at that. Uh, they have uh, seduced my people, saying, peace, and there is no peace. Now, that, that alerts you to the fact that one of the things that false prophets talk about a lot is peace. Uh, we have, like I said, I can't think of a single politician that hasn't made a peace, at least some part of his platform. And the fact of the matter is, is that none of them are going to succeed until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And so over and over in Ezekiel and in Jeremiah... He's talking about it's, being, it's the false prophets that are saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Back to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You know what I uh, found? I found that when it comes to, uh, uh, if you want a safe place, the Bible says that uh, putting your trust in the Lord is safe. That's one. And the other safe place is counsel of the godly. <laughs> counsel and the Lord. Counsel and the Lord. Verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, see, you're not them. Except for the second time he addresses the brethren thing. Uh, back uh, back in verse 1, the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need. You're, you're different from them, brethren, right? Verse 4, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness. They don't know what's going on. They'll believe a false prophet because they're willing to believe a lie. They're willing to believe anything that offers them hope because they don't have any hope. To me, that's the sad tragedy of Christians who aren't reading their Bibles and would rather, you know, believe the, the, the good news and the, the honey and, and sugar that comes off of lips of unsaved men than they're willing to listen to the Bible and hear the truth. Because the fact is, in verse 4, you brethren, you're, you're not of the darkness. Those people are of the darkness, right? Your average college professor abides and lives in darkness, Right? The average clergyman abides and lives in darkness. It goes on to say, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you uh, as a thief. And it won't overtake us as a thief, because we're going we're gonna to get out of here. And that's the point. Ye, brethren, are not in darkness. I mean, you, you know these things. Verse 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. I mean, God is light, right? Uh, the Word of God is light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and you have the words of God. You are children of the light. They are children of the darkness. They do not know what's happening. 
They do not know where they're going. They don't know where they've been. They don't know where they came from. Uh, if they don't know the answers, it's also because they don't even know the questions. And that's not, the time, that's not where we abide. Verse 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Now Paul said uh, the night is far spent. The, the day is at hand. Um, the, the, technically the time that we abide in, as far as if you're talking about dispensations, it's a night time. Right? And we're waiting for the Son of Righteousness to arise with healing in His wings. Correct? We read that back in Malachi a little while ago. All right? And even though it's night, we're not children of the darkness. In other words, we're walking in opposition to uh, where this world is walking because they walk in darkness. They are of darkness. That's not what we are. Um, if it ever disturbs you, that it seems like every time you open your mouth for Christ or for the Bible or, or for anything spiritually pure, that you seem to get it in the neck. And, uh, you know, it, every time you open your mouth, it's obvious that you're going against everyone's grain. You have to remember they are the children of the darkness. You're the children of light. You're really not supposed to get along with them in that respect. Right? Verse 5, you're all the children of light. And the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others. Let us watch and be sober. And uh, everybody's familiar with the admonition. I know it's all true, but this is the wrong time to be sleeping. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of Christians are sleeping. Laodicea is a lukewarm period in church history. <clears throat> but <clears throat> we ought not be sleeping. If there's ever a time to wake up, it's now. Look, if there's anybody that's going to be awake, who would it be? What? Well, those Methodists are sure awake, aren't they? Yeah, boy. I mean, the Presbyterians, they're on top of stuff, aren't they? When you look around at, you know, uh, many Baptists and so on, that's why I don't really wave the Baptist banner as hard as some of my brethren. Because I'm a Bible believer before I'm a Baptist. And it's the Bible that makes the difference for me. You say, well, Christ is supposed to make the difference for you. Yeah, but I don't know Christ without the Bible. And so that's the thing, folks. I mean, ultimately, uh, again, the ultimate philosophical question uh, to be settled in life is what is your final authority? And if that sounds like a cliche, what's the final court of appeal in your life? Who gets to say what's so and what's not? Because make no mistake about it, there are folks out there in the world and uh, they have definitive and definite and hard ideas about what is so and what's not. And the reason that they believe that is why? Because somebody told them. Look, folks, uh, faith cometh by hearing, period. Right? You'll believe who you listen to. And uh, everybody listens to somebody. And that's the thing. Well, you people are just following a man. You're just following that Bible. Well, that's true, but you're following something too. Because if you're not following the Bible or the pastor or whatever, you're following some scientist or some group of scientists or what some professor said or what you read as, you know, in combination and amalgamation with what your friend thinks who knows this guy who's a chemist or whatever. Now, folks, everybody has faith. Everybody has faith because faith cometh by hearing you sit in front of a boob tube and listen to the radio and read the newspaper and go to college and all those things, you're going to come out with some sort of an assortment of belief, and the reason you believe it is not because you investigated each and everything in it. It's because you believe it. It's because you heard it and you believe it. Nobody investigates everything. You're not an original thinker. No, you're not. Who here invented anything? That's what I thought. You are not an original thinker. You have not come up with some original philosophy or an original opinion about something. You've reached what you believe by hearing somebody else say what you should, and you may have customized things a little bit and all that sort of thing, but in the end, faith cometh by hearing, and real hearing comes by the Word of God. And so that's the thing, and that's where we're at. Uh, verse uh, six. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Uh, you're supposed to watch and be sober because you know 
and they don't know. Verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, are, are drunken in the night. I know that some people are drunken in the daytime, but uh, you know, if you want to you know, get technical about it, you, know, you go down and, uh, you know, at 12 o'clock at night versus noontime and see how many drunks you find you know, outside a bar. Verse, it's at nighttime. Verse 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, <clears throat> putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a an helmet the hope of salvation. Verse 8 is a good thing. Uh, let us who are of the day be sober. doesn't mean that uh, there's not a, a joy in, uh, in the Christian life. doesn't mean that somebody can't uh, joke and, and, and have fun and that sort of thing. But the fact of the matter is, is because of the, the, the body of knowledge that you have, it's a, it's a weighty, monumental, sober amount of knowledge. I mean, um, I, you know, if, <laughs> honestly, folks, uh, if evolutionists truly believe what they say they believe, you know, I don't know why you don't just go out and blow your head off. Because, I mean, yeah, seriously, I mean, really, you talk about a, a monumental piece of knowledge. I came from a great ape. My great-grandmother was an ape. And before that, it was something else that crawled out from the sea somewhere. Right? Boy, that's powerful and life-changing. I came from nothing, and that's where I'm going back. I've got 70 years here to enjoy consciousness and being. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, you know. And so uh, you talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, what you know from the Bible ought to weigh heavy on your heart because you're going to live for eternity. And so it's, it's worth being sober and somber about here as far as the things that, that we deal with. We deal in eternal things. And the knowledge that you hear at Blessed Hope Baptist Church, and that you read at your, on your couch or whatever, you know, before you go to work, those things are eternal things. We'll still be dealing with those things a thousand years from now. You'll still be dealing with the things of God a million years from now. Verse, except then we'll be without this stinking body, right? Yeah. Verse uh, 8. But let us who are of the day uh, be sober. Uh, we're in the nighttime. The day is coming. Things are going to get worse. It's going to get darker before the dawn. So you need to be sober. You need to be serious about it. Uh, quit worrying about who won the Oscar. Who won an Emmy and who might win the Super Bowl next year and who's the, who are the Vikings going to draft? It doesn't matter. Is Favre going to retire and go back to Green Bay? I mean, verse, <laughs> verse 8. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on uh, the breastplate of faith and love. Now, that's a blessed breastplate of righteousness in uh, Ephesians 6. So you have two breastplates. Maybe it's the same breastplate in the New Testament. A breastplate of righteousness and a breastplate of faith and love. So righteousness, faith, and love ought to go well together. And a breastplate is protective. It protects the vital organs, obviously. And, you know, so the faith and the love and the righteousness go well together. You need not believe anything that's unrighteous. You realize if you were a Muslim what you'd have to believe? You'd have to believe that you were justified to take a backpack, fill it full of grenades, and go blow up grandmas and children at the local mall. That would be glorifying to your God. That's disgusting. Correct? It's unrighteous. You don't have to believe that. You don't have to believe that. If you believe Freud, you know what you believe? You believe some unrighteous nonsense. That man was a twisted dude. He was a pervert of the first order. Right? We're not called to believe something that's wrong. Sometimes the world tries to convince us that what we believe is wrong. That judgment is disgusting. And your negativism and your criticism of mankind is a disgusting thing. No, it's a righteous thing. But the righteousness and the faith and the love go together. You're not called to love anything unrighteous. Right? 
All right, that was encouraging. Verse 8. Well, that's who of the day be sober, putting on a breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. It's not just that you have salvation, but you're to put on the helmet of the hope of salvation. Again, a helmet is protective. It keeps your head safe. <laughs> you got to have the right kind of hopes to keep your head safe. And there are an awful lot of folks that have the wrong kind of hopes. They hope to win the lottery. When they win the lottery, it'll destroy them. In the meantime, they're destroying their lives by going there. Right? Uh, hope is protective. Hope is a helm. The hope of salvation is protective. Our, what you place your hope in and what you look forward to and what you anticipate, it's a healthy thing. They are trying to tell us that us waiting for Christ to come get us out of here makes us whack jobs, that we are unsafe for the rest of society to hang around. It's the safest thing there is. We're going to get out of this joint, right? And uh, you need to have that hope. That hope needs to be real to you. The hope of salvation. The hope that when you die one day, I'm not talking about, boy, I hope so either. I'm talking about where you place your hope, where you place your trust, what you're anticipating in that, in that respect. Verse um, 8, And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. That hope will keep your mind sane. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. There's an awful lot of the sound mind that has to do with having your hopes placed in the right thing. You realize that if uh, somebody spent a lifetime hoping in a lie and, uh, you know, over a lifetime realizing that, that what they believed in life was a lie, you know, sequentially just one thing after another falling apart, never stop to consider you know, what, what kind of shape your mind might be in by the time you're 60, 65, or 70? I mean, if you didn't believe the truth, sanctify them through that truth, thy word is truth, that if you spent a lifetime of believing lies and being guilty and having a seared conscience and a guilty conscience and a defiled mind and a polluted mind and a corrupt mind, all those things, maybe that's why people go crazy. Maybe that's why they have no protection sometimes. You understand? All right, verse, uh, verse 8. For a helmet, the hope of salvation. Uh, again, I just emphasize those two things in verse 8 are protective. Uh, over your head, uh, the, the brain is, you know, obviously one of the more important organs that you have, even though some people don't seem to use theirs too much. Um, and uh, if you've got a breastplate on, it covers generally, you know, uh, a navel to chest. And that's where all your vital organs are. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on uh, the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going through the tribulation. We're not appointed to wrath. We're not going to hell. We're not appointed to wrath. We're appointed to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Questions or comments for the day? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Good, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, again, the, the biblical hope is an expectation. It's a, it's a uh, what word did I use a little while ago? You anticipate it. That's not how the word, world uses hope. The hope is just, the, the world is just wishing it were so.